Hello and welcome to Smiles Live. I'm your host Kevin McAleer uh, and today we'll be looking at programming the uh, Arduino using a Raspberry Pi 4 and we'll be looking at positioning and how to capture our position in 3D space. Uh, something that's actually not quite that easy to do as it turns out um, as I spent the past couple of days looking into. Um, so for people who are not aware what Smiles is, it's uh, an amazing low-cost open source 3D printable robot that's very easy to print yourself and assemble, very little electronics and programming skills required to get started. Uh, but this is a bit more of an advanced topic today, uh, all about positioning. So let me go over to um, some notes that I prepared. So yes, let's get into it. So I've got a quick video to show you that I've prepared. That was about the fourth shot of me trying to throw those little bags on the uh, on the desk. So that's one of the, uh, the little sensors that we're using today, and that's some flux. And what I've done there is just prepared the board and the, the header pins with some flux, just to make it easier to solder. So I'm just using some blue tack there just to keep the header pins nicely in place. And I've uh, just got a very cheap, simple soldering iron. It isn't one that's. Um, control temperature wise it's just straight into the mains so I was quite surprised how well the uh, the soldering went on this uh, but that's all down to using the uh, the flux it just um, snaps right into place I'm also surprised the uh, the little board didn't fall off that little crocodile clip there it looks very precariously placed There's a slightly more zoomed in shot of a, of a second one that I did. So you can see how it just snaps into place. And that's, that's the flux that's helping it do that. So the soldering iron is just trying to heat both up that little um, track on the board as well as the pin. That ground one didn't quite look right there but that looks good now. And then I use PCB flux cleaner just to get rid of any flux. Flux does make the pins rust or any of the tracks. You'll get like a oxidization on there if you don't clean that off. So I usually just give that a good um, scrub after I've uh, applied it. There we go, that's the finished article. So that's the uh, GY271. Then what I did was um, I quickly put together in Fusion 360 um, a little holder so that we could um, attach this to the Smiles robot at the back. So this is, um, it only took about 45 minutes to actually print this out and uh, pretty much worked first time. The only measurement that I got wrong was the um, the bit where it slides into the Smiles was just very tight so I just did a second version that was a bit easier to slide into place. And there we go, that's the finished article and it's got the X, Y and Z uh, inlaid there as well. So you just literally put the uh, the little component in into the uh, the holder there, wire it up, and away we go. That's the uh, the test bed that I use for all my stuff. I call that one the Harley Quinn because it's uh, almost every single colour going there. So if we've gone to then the science of positioning, um, really there's there's two different types of positioning that we can uh, we can achieve. We can do relative position where we calculate by measuring angular velocity which is a very fancy sounding term which really just means that we're measuring uh, one place to another and that's why it's relative. We don't know where we started or where we're going to. We can just measure how quickly we're getting there. And um, the second one for relative is the compass heading so we can measure things like the azimuth, the heading, uh, and so on but we don't really know where we are within space we just know where we are relative to the the north pole or magnetic north which is very close to that and then absolute positioning is calculated by measuring the distance of say three satellites in orbit you can have more than three usually uh, if you're flying a drone you want to get about seven or more to get a, a nice stable uh, position um, or you can use something like three bluetooth beacons at known locations and triangulate from there 
Um, whichever of these methods that you use to position, you have to use some kind of triangulation. And that's why it gets complicated because you're working in three dimensional space. You need to understand trig. And just to make things more complicated, those measurements can be um, changed or, or biased by the acceleration of the device. And that's why I usually pair these things up with an accelerometer of some kind. So what can we say about this? Relative positioning is usually done on board without the need for any external devices. So we can measure the device. If you think about like an iPhone or an Android phone, um, you know, they've got a built-in compass, they've got built-in GPSs, they don't need anything um, um, for relative positioning outside of the device. For, for GPSs, I should say, that's an absolute position. Uh, that requires some fixed point to be detected. So, you know, it, it took um, an army of satellites in orbit, in orbit to be able to position uh, using GPS. Or, you know, if it's Bluetooth beacons, say, I know shopping malls sometimes have these Bluetooth beacons installed now. Uh, and really, you're doing the same kind of thing there. You're just measuring the uh, the time of flight, the distance between you and the thing that's of a known distance um, from other points. So, you know, with, with Bluetooth beacons, you know, the way I imagined it is um, you could position, say, three to four Bluetooth beacons around your house. Um, you could then accurately measure them with a tape measure um, to know exactly how far apart they are from each other. And then if you have a robot in the middle of them, it can work out where it is because those other points are known. So relative positioning is generally cheaper, you know, so the, the components that we're going to be looking at are about two, two pounds, two and a bit dollars, not very much at all. But absolute positioning tends to be a little bit more expensive. So you can see it's like an order of magnitude more expensive, still affordable. But, um, you know, if you wanted to make a lot of these or we want to make a classroom full of them, then uh, th it's not really going to help if they cost uh, upwards f for the whole thing of, uh, you know, thirty dollars, something like that. So these are the, the sensors we've been looking at today. So the MPU 6050 is a gyroscope and accelerometer, it also measures temperature. And we'll get on to why it has a temperature sensor. So when I looked at that, that was about £2.50 for a single, a single uh, circuit. Then there is um, the GY271. Now that has other names as well. It's got the HC, HMC5883L. Uh, and sometimes these are passed off um, Whereas in actual fact, there are QMC 5883L and they're, they're a cheaper, less accurate uh, magnetometer. Um, again, they're only about two pounds, not very expensive. And then the big brother that's got all of these things combined is the MPU 9250. And that's a gyroscope, accelerometer and magnetometer. And that's about seven pounds. I've got one of those in the post at the moment. But, um, I didn't have one of those today to uh, experiment with. So if we look at this um, 6050, first of all, uh, it's what they call a MEMS device. It's Micro Electronical Mechanical System. Um, so, you know, I often wondered how on earth do these things actually work? Um, let me just go back so you can see me on there as well. Hi. So, yeah, how on earth do these things actually work? If you think like a regular gyroscope, you know, you've got a spinning wheel and any sort of difference from that, um, you, can, you can detect the force. Um, and it's the spinning motion that, that enables that force to be quite steady and accurately measured. Um, this thing hasn't got a tiny little wheel in it. It certainly hasn't got three of them. Uh, but it has got um, a, a mechanical, it's got um, a sort of shape. I suppose it's a bit like that. And it has another shape in between. And as the thing moves around, it can actually detect that force because these things are uh, made of iron. And you can detect um, using, you know, magnets and electricity you can detect motion in that and you can do that very accurately because these things are very small and very sensitive um, it does mean that it's susceptible to out you know external magnets so if you're if you're near a large speaker or you've just got um, you know a washing machine on something like that that's got a large motor in it then that will interfere with it a little bit um, but these things are quite accurate and the idea is you take a number of readings over time rather than just one reading you take a, a few and average it and we call that smoothing so the way that these things work, um, they measure gravity and force applied to the gyro. Um, so we have to take into account the acceleration um, because if you've got um, something that's planet to Earth, so it's, um, it's detecting on the z-axis, you know, gravity at one, uh, one g. Um, if you tilt that device like that, you're actually going to measure 
half on on one axis and half on the on the y axis you're going to measure that as well so you can see that both of them will be half the value of one and that's how we know that it's at a 45 degree angle uh, it gets more complicated as you start tilting the device in different orientations but if you move the device if it's if it's moving through space um, then that, that angular momentum i'm trying to show you like a, a t-shape there instead of it measuring straight down it's going to measure it at an angle so we need to detect that force and take that away from the measurement so that we get a true um, orientation of where down is rather than thinking it's that way, sideways. So they're used in drones quite often and self-balancing robots, this very chip. I've seen quite a few um, uh, of these used. I know uh, James Bruton uses these in, uh, in, in his latest um, self-balancing robot. I think he did a paid piece for, um, is it JL, JCB speak, JLC, J I have no idea. Some three-letter name of company who produce speakers. And um, yeah, they asked him to produce a robot to stick the speaker on because it looked like a face. So yeah, they're used in drones, balancing robots. They use this I to C or I squared C protocol, which just requires two pins, uh, one for clock, one for data, as well as the, um, the ground and 3.3 or 5 volts. Most of these have got a, a regulator on them. Um, you can see on the very top of this uh, picture here, that's the regulator there, it's the, the big device. And um, they also include a temperature sensor. So the reason for this is all these measurements about um, where we are in space taken from gravity metrics. These assume that the reading is taken at 60 degrees. So if something isn't 60 degrees, we have to then, again, adjust for that. Uh, and this little chip on, on the here, it's got a little... Um, a DMP, a little um, um, discrete uh, processor on there that can do a lot of the heavy lifting for us maths wise. So what we can do is we can just say, you know, take into effect, take into account the effect of this difference in temperature from 60 degrees. So the DMP will adjust those calculations and give us just what we want. So in this case, it's going to give us back seven values. So we've got um, the accelerometers X, Y and Z. We've got a temperature and then we've got the gyros x y and z uh, and what we we do is put that through a few different functions to work out where we are heading um, so again this is with the mpu chip you can't say precisely where you are just where you are heading away away from a particular point so the the animation i've seen and i'll, I'll set i'll put a few links in the um in the description below that we've used um, as it's sort of turning in 3d space so if we think, um, look, most of my robots are just sat here, we can use this one. So we've got this robot and it's turning like this. We can work out how quickly is this turning. And then we can then work out, based on how quickly it's turning, from when we started measuring it, so if we started measuring there, you know, period one in time, and then it gets to here, we, we know that that's 45 degrees based on how quickly it was rotating. So this is what I mean about the trigonometry and the bit more complicated maths that are involved. Um, but luckily there are some people on the internet who've done really good work. So um, Jot Brocking is one of them. Um, and I'll, I'll, I think there's a slide on here that's got some of the other people that I've looked at and uh, they've written some really great code uh, to make this easier for us. So that's the 6050. Um, let me just get back to my slides and then the next one is the GY271 or the HC, uh, HMC5883, which again, sometimes you see these online and they're actually a QMC5883. And I believe the difference is, is accuracy um, and the other ones are slightly cheaper, I believe, the Q ones. So again, they're, they're another MEMS device. Uh, this time they measure the Earth's magnetic field. Um, it uses the I to C protocol again, so nice and simple for us to uh, connect this all up. Um, and this one can be used, it returns three values, X, Y, and Z, but you can use those to work out the azimuth, which is really what we're after. We just want to know if, if that's north, what are we from that? And that's the azimuth, the difference between the two. Um, we can then use that for things like, if we want to know what, you know, we're traveling along in our little Smars robot and we want to do a 90 degree turn, this is ideal for that because we can work out, you know, from where we are, what does 90 degrees look like? We can do that from the MPU, but this is a lot easier to do. Uh, we can also do things like the heading, the, the bearing, which is the north, northeast, east, and so on. 
you can get a three letter bearing from some of the uh, library functions we'll be looking at. And um, to make this work, this little um, um, magnetometer needs to know where you are on the Earth. Now you might think, well I don't need to do that with my mobile phone, but your mobile phone tends to have a GPS module in it, and that knows where you are on Earth, and then can then do a quick look up to a website we'll look at in a second, which will work out what your declination is. And the declination is like where on the globe you actually are, um, and what what measurement it therefore needs to take off and adjust um, from these X, Y, and Zs. So let's have a look what, what this all means. Um, so connecting this thing up to I to C, um, you can see there we've got um, a couple of pins. The, the very bottom pin is um, is an interrupt pin. And essentially what this says is um, it's got DR, DY, it's ready. So the device is ready. It means it's taken all three readings and the buffer has been supplied with a new reading ready to take. So you can wire that up to the, uh, the Arduino um, interrupt pin if you wanted to, but really it works just as well without this, just using the library functions. And um, what I've 3D printed there, you can see, is the, uh, the little holder. So I've just put this in here. Now, <laughs> I've got to confess, when I wired up uh, a few of these, uh, I bought five of them, um, I wired them incorrectly because I'd soldered them on. So the pins are sticking sort of straight up like that, but the actual instructions of, you know, where the voltage is and so on are underneath. So it kind of, you've got to reverse it in your mind or just check when, you, when you're putting these together that, you know, the voltage is on the top and therefore it's on that side as well. So I did it wrong and uh, it got very hot. And what frustrated me is um, on this picture here, I'd super glued that in so that it was absolutely straight in the SMARS. Um, because I've super glued it in, there's no way I could remove that. So that whole thing was just ruined. So that frustrated me greatly. And like I said, this uh, this gap here, I hadn't quite worked out properly on that particular one. So when I forced that into this SMARS, there was no way that's ever coming out without just ruining the chassis completely. So very frustrated by that whole bit. Um, so that's um, the I2C protocol you can see on the um, the image there from the Arduino board. Um, it's just going through a motor shield and I wanted to make sure it worked well with our Fungimoto boards, which I use because um, I, I like the fact they've got things like the, the header on there for the rangefinder. They've got some Bluetooth headers as well. Um, they've got some servo headers as well as a nice buzzer there as well. So all ready to go. I wanted to make sure this worked well as well as the actual motors as well. So pins um, four and five. Um, four is the, um, let me just make sure I say these correct. So on here, four is the data pin, so I usually have that as the blue wire. Five is the clock, which just gives us our sort of pulse to sort of keep everything in sync. And red is the voltage and uh, brown or black is the ground. So this is um, a little animation I put together just to try and explain this declination thing because um, I didn't quite understand what this was all about really. So if you think the Earth magnetic field looks like this, depending where we are on Earth, we have a different orientation to the North Pole and the way where we, we read the magnetic field will be at a different angle. Um, so somebody in the so southern hemisphere, somebody at the equator or somebody at the sort of northern hemisphere will have very different readings when they take a measurement using one of these uh, magnetometers. And it's because of the way these, these uh, fields spread out um, and get closer together depending on what your inclination or declination is on the Earth. So there is a website that's called magnet or magnetic-declination.com and you can type in... Um, your location, so I've put in my hometown there, Belmont, and the uh, nice green belt around um, Bolton in Manchester. And um, that's my magnetic declination there, so minus zero and 58, and then negative west. So what we need to put in there is um, zero minus 58, uh, and we'll use that in some of the code libraries to get our declination understood by the magnetometer. So here are some of the links. Uh, like I said, I'll put these into the um, the show notes, um, the description. So the first one is um, uh, a nice compass program. If I open up this, um, look at it on uh, GitHub. Um, it's a very nice library that somebody's put together. Uh, and you can do things like get X, get Y, get Z, get Azimuth, which calculates based on those X, Y, and Zs. 
You can um, also use that declination to um, make the calculation more accurate. And, oops, and this is what it actually gives you here. So we get an X, we get a Y, we get a Z, we get an azimuth, we get a bearing, which is a, um, a number between 1 and 16, well, 0 and 15, and a direction like north, northwest. And um, very simple to use, you just do compass.init, um, you set the address of the I to C, and I've got um, a little program I can show you in a second, which can um, scan your I to C bus to see what your device is. And that's one of the ways that we can tell if it's a genuine um, GY, um, uh, what's the name of the, uh, the device there? GY271. So many letters and numbers this week. I've been uh, scrambled my brain with them. So if you've got a genuine one, which is the, the genuine one, HMC5883L, or if you've got a QMC5883L, um, you can tell the difference by the address. So that's one of the ways, and they talk about that on some of the, uh, the YouTube videos. Okay, and then there's some other things as well about how fast the data comes through, whether we want to um, smooth it, um, and this is something that we definitely want to do. And all that smoothing does is it will take, um, so let's say we were looking at the, uh, the X axis. Um, we can just take a reading, we can take another reading and add it to a total, take another reading, add it to the total. And then when we've got say 10 readings, we can divide that by 10 and we've got an average of all those 10 readings. And that will give us a much more smoother kind of um, sweep. And if you think about a regular uh, magnet in a, in a compass, um, the compass heading very slowly rotates if I have my phone, which I'm using to record at the moment, and I have the, uh, the Compass app open on there, uh, we could see that um, you know, it's, it very smoothly moves across on the axis, and that's because there's uh, quite a lot of smoothing happening. Otherwise, it'd be jumping all over the show, because you do get all the little spikes and uh, electromagnetic, electromagnetic glitches and so on that are devices nearby. Um, and then we've got the, the calibration as well. So there's lots of different... Um, things that this library can do and I think it's it's really a great piece of work so um, let's just find the person who uh, created this and give them some good credit so M programs is the the author to this and uh, they've done a great job okay so if I just jump back to keynote then the um, the drone robot workshop is another one I looked at um, this guy here has done an amazing piece of work um, with these low-cost um, IMU devices. His um, thing is obviously looking at drones and self-leveling drones and um, he uses this little LCD display to, to show what the current pitch and roll. So if you remember like a, an aeroplane, um, again if I get my Smiles robot here, so when I move up and down like this that is my pitch. When I roll side to side like that that's my roll and when I spin round that's called yaw so you can work out pitch and roll very simply but to do yaw properly you need to have a magnetometer okay so he's done some great videos and um, tutorials on uh, how all this works and some of the maths he explains it very well um, talks about the digital motion processor the DMP and things that you can get it to do um, it's quite a powerful little chip on there. There's not very much documentation about it, unfortunately, so um, it means we can't offload a lot of the work. But what you can do on this particular chip, this uh, 6050, it's got an, in an external IC I2C data and I2C clock. So you can actually chain these together and have the output of the, um, say, the magnetometer be processed by the DMP um, for you. So you don't have to do any of that calculation on the Arduino and it's free to um, use you know, the little power that it has to do other things with. So very smart piece of technology. There's quite a lot of libraries and things on there. Um, now, this brings me to one of the points about you know how I go about learning things. I like to be quite hands-on and I'll just hack things around and burn things and blow them up. Um, rather than sitting down and reading everything first and getting a really good grasp of the science. And I think what that's taught me um, on this little journey I've had you know, learning about positioning is that um, 
sometimes you do have to sit down and read the uh, the boring science stuff behind it because without that knowledge um, you'll never get the answer you're looking for and you really won't understand why the thing isn't working if you're getting some readings which don't seem to make sense so the, the actual steps to understanding these things discreetly in and of themselves are quite simple it's when you amass the whole thing together that it gets complicated so so this is, um, I'll, as we get into some of the code, you can see um, and judge for yourself how, uh, how well I've done on this. Okay, so let's go back to the slides again. And then the other link there is the magnetic declination site, which uh, enables us to, um, it always defaults to Camelford, must be where the author lives. And you can just click on a particular point and it'll give you the, uh, the declination there. So there we go. So that's uh, the three main links that I wanted to share. So now if we go over to our um, smiles cam, we can see we've got a, a couple of smiles set up there. So one of them has got the uh, the magnetometer installed, this one here, and this other one has got the, uh, the 6050 installed. Uh, and they've just got the little, um, um, let me just bring this out so you can see on the uh, full screen. Um, it's got this little uh, thing that I built on the back. It's not quite, not quite straight there, but the whole thing's a bit off. That's fine, so that's that. Um, if we now go over to um, our split screen. So I've got my Raspberry Pi plugged in. I've got some code libraries um, set up, ready to go. So if I just go full screen on the Raspberry Pi for a second, we can have a look and see what we have. So the first one is this i to c scanner. So if I open up this, um, I think I've opened up in the wrong one there. Let me just do that uh, in the Arduino IDE. So open. Let's find that um, I see scanner. Okay. Let's give that a compile. I've not checked if I've got all the libraries installed on here yet. Um, it required quite a lot of preparation to today's session, so um, I feel a little bit unprepared for this, if I'm honest. But um, let's let's give it a go and see what happens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload this uh, I see scanner. Um, we just need to tell it which port we are on, so let's just make sure we've got that USB selected. Let's give it another, another upload. Okay, so now if we open up our serial port, so you can see this, the scanner is running and it's looking for some devices. Have we got the thing wired in? We have got it wired in. Uh, if it doesn't detect it, then that's a sign that things are not all good. Let's make sure that's not hot or anything. Sometimes when I upload them as well, I just find that you've just got to give them a reset as well. Let's make sure that's all good. I'll tell you what, let's try it on the, the other board and see what we get. So I'll try the uh, 6050. So let's plug that in there and then let's wait for it to catch up on the uh, serial. Okay, so let's just upload that. Let's detect the port again. Oh, there we go. That's why I had it open on the wrong one. So that one says Arduino. Let's try uploading that. Done. Let's open up the serial monitor. So there we go. It's detected one device. Uh, and in this case, the address is uh, 68. Sometimes you need to tell it that sometimes these uh, libraries already know what to look for and that's because a lot of these devices assume that there's only going to be one device of, uh, of this type uh, installed and therefore um, they, they know what the address will be. These addresses don't tend to change. In fact, some of the, uh, the little boards have like a, a solder point on you, or you can uh, you know, solder two points together to give it a different address. So they, they tend to be quite um, fixed. Okay, so so that's that. So now that we've detected um, 
um, our I2C address, um, it's using the wrong mouse there, we can close out this uh, window. Let's go full screen on the Raspberry Pi so we can. Okay. And let's try opening up um, a different one now. So we'll go for the uh, one of these ones. Okay. Let's try that. Again, I need to open that in the uh, Arduino. So let's go for open. Let's jump back into the uh, DMP folder, is it? No, it was the other one, sorry. Okay. Just asking me to move it into a folder of the same name. It's quite fussy like that. Right, okay. So this is another um, key contributor, Jeff Roberg. He's done an awful lot of work um, making these um, 6050s work well. Um, I think there's a link to his uh, website somewhere in the code. Um, there we go. And it's the I2C devlib uh, that he's been maintaining. And you know his his purpose, his uh, objective there, is to make this as sort of easy as possible to uh, to use. Um, he's got different boards and different I2C devices on here. Um, so all we do is we find the one that we're after, or you know the board that we're after. So say the Arduino. We then find all the different devices that are possible to connect to. So we've got the 6050 there. Excuse my little chihuahua. We get very nervous when uh, there's anybody at the, at the door. And, the, the, and what you do is you download this as a zip file. You can then import um, this as a library and it will import all these examples. So when you go to your Arduino, go to the, uh, the examples and the sketches, you'll find all these things there. Okay, so the first one we can do is this raw one. This one will actually show us, um, I don't need to open it there actually. Uh, this one shows us the raw, the raw figures that actually come out of the, um, the device. So if I just upload this code, so it's gonna complain that I've not got the I2C, I squared C library uh, installed. So what we need to do is go to manage libraries and we just need to grab that one. So I think this is one of the ones that's published um, to the Arduino's central repository. So let me just wait for that to open up. And then we just type in the search field there, I2C dev. Uh, if we can't find that, we can just download the, uh, the, the code from GitHub. So I2C dev, let's just give that a search. I was pretty sure that it was on here actually. If not, okay, well, we'll just go back to uh, GitHub and we'll just download the whole thing. Okay, so if we just download this as a zip file, there we go. And if we now go to our Arduino IDE, let's just come out of this, go back to um, sketch and add zip file, zip library. So that'll be in our downloads folder. And there we go, I'd see DevLib Master. So he's complaining about that. I think we have to uh, unzip that first of all. Okay, let's just do that. So if we just extract that, extract to, um, did I really want to do that? I to see dev, let's just call it that. Extract here. Okay, there we go. So within that, there we go. We've got all these different things. I think what it says is to move this Arduino folder and all this stuff into the, uh, the library. So if we do exactly that, we just grab all these files it's so going to do uh, control C. We're going to our Arduino, go into our libraries. I think we just paste that in. I think that's how that works. 
Right, let's try again. So if we just uh, try uploading that. No, I'm still not happy with that. Sorry about this. Let me just try that again. Manage libraries. screen on the Raspberry Pi so we can see what we're doing. No, it's not that one. Good grief. Come on. So it sketches and add file. So let's go to our Pi, our Arduino, our libraries. And where's it got I to see dev? See, it's got the library in there. It should have picked that up. Let's so give that one more go. So, include library. Add zip file. I don't think it has to be a zip because it can be a folder instead. So, we go for that. We go for libraries. And we go for I to see dev and OK that. No, it's not happy with that. Oh, that's frustrating. Let me just have a quick look. This is what I was saying about <clears throat> rather than read what I'm supposed to do, I just jump straight in. Waste a load of time figuring out what I need to do. So there we go. To use this library, just place the I2C CPP source in any device library's source files in the same folder as your sketch. Let's give that a go then. So let's find the ITC dev library. Let's just grab all that. Let's go back to our our home folder and let's put this into here. So this was the MPU 6050. And it's inside that folder there, I think. So if we just paste them in. Now if we try again, let's see if, it's, if that works. So, what's it not happy with now? So this worked fine when I was there, experimenting with this on the, the Mac that I've got. So, it doesn't like this MPU. 6050, so let's try just finding that code again in that library folder. I think it might be a different bit that we need to borrow. So let's try all that stuff there. Grab all that, copy that, go back to our code and just drop this in. So, skip that, okay. So, this whole piece of work I've been doing this week has been, every single time I've been trying to do something, there's, there's been some kind of uh, issue or problem or glitch or setback. Um, <laughs> been driving me absolutely nuts whether it's the physical thing whether it's blowing up the little devices uh, and then when I've got the whole thing wired together and um, working as I would expect it to work um, we don't often get the, the things to work in the way that we want let's try a different library let's try something else completely different um, so let's go to the calibration so So the calibration is for, I'm jumping around a little bit here and there. So the two boards that we've got, the, we've got the magnetometer and we've got the gyro, you know, the accelerator and gyroscope. Um, both of them require some type of calibration. So the, the MPU 6050 
um, the, the, what that requires in the way of calibration is it needs to take about a thousand to two thousand readings and you just leave the device completely still and it will just take loads of readings and then based on after those 2000 um, samples it will average out all those values and then it will be able to work out on those three axes um, which of them is um, pointing straight down and therefore it can work out the sort of the pitch and the roll pitch and roll not yar so that's what it needs to do in the way of calibration. I think this calibration, if I remember correctly, is probably for the magnetometer, and that requires a different type of calibration. So that requires the declination where you are on the Earth, um, as well as moving ground, a bit like a drone, really. You have to get the, uh, the device and, um, and move it in all the different directions. And then once it's got a reading from each orientation, it'll then say it's calibrated. It'll give you a string of numbers, which is what this one is all about. Um, and you, you put that into your code just after you initialize the compass. Uh, and that enables it then to, um, to know its orientation in 3D space much better based on where you are on the Earth. So let's try that other library, which was the uh, calibration one. I'll have to see what was going on in there. So let's just make that full screen there. So yes, this one is the one for the the magnetometer so let's just make sure we've got that one plugged in there so we have there we go and if we just um, upload that ah, it's the libraries I said the libraries weren't set up didn't I that's really frustrating let me just check and see if that one is available on the standard Arduino libraries if not we'll have to give that one a miss as well and what I'll do is I'll do a part two of this where I've actually spent the time to figure these things out and I can come with an actual proposed solution. So what I typically do with these live streams is I set myself a challenge to sort of learn, write up a tutorial, do all the preparation in about two days um, in between everything else that's going on. Uh, and sometimes I hit that target and sometimes like today I don't hit that target and I feel a bit unsatisfied that things haven't quite gone to plan. But hey, all these things happen, and this is all part of being a, a maker. This is all part of the experience of learning new things. I think you learn more by uh, mistakes, and if everything went perfectly to plan, um, that's that's certainly something I've discovered. So let's just try and search for QMC. Uh, if it can't find any boards or any libraries to do with that, ah, there it is. Thank goodness for that. All right, let's go full screen on the Raspberry Pi. Let's install that. Uh, once that's installed, we can run this calibration code. Okay, that's done. Let's try compiling that again. Okay, let's upload that. And then let's open up the serial monitor. Uh, what it says there is um, the calibration will begin in five seconds. So what you have to do, I'll pick the device up. And if I go to... Um, split screen you can see there you've got to sort of orient it and try and move it around in all different orientations uh, and once you've done that um, it will come up and say that it's um, this is what you need to put in there now if you remember when we were trying to connect to this um, a couple of minutes ago um, it wouldn't actually connect to that device I've got it plugged into the wrong one that's why let's try that again let's try uploading that to the, uh, the correct one Oh, I just have to wait for the uh, serial monitor to change to the right port. So this is USB. Let's try uploading that now. Okay. Let's see what happens. Let's just go full screen on the Raspberry Pi so we can see what's going on. So done uploading. Let's go to the serial monitor. And let's give it a restart. Not 
doesn't seem to be doing anything once again. Okay, let's just try that one more time. Let's get another upload. Upload's okay. Go to the serial monitor. And then nothing happens. I think that's because it hasn't detected it for some bizarre reason. Okay, let's try using a different chip. So let's use this chip instead. Again, make sure I've got the orientation of all this correct. Yep. So I'm just going to try a spare chip that I have uh, soldered. So I'm just trying to plug this in. There we go. And then clock. And then data. Very loose fitting. Right, let's try that again. So, if we just reboot now, we look on the serial port. Right, let's see if that's going to work. There we go. So, it's asking me to move it around. So, if I go to my split screen, so what I'm doing here, there's a little chip. Um, let's try and get it in front of the camera. So, I'm just wiggling this around and then in all the different orientations that it can be in. Once that's complete, um, it'll say on the serial monitor that um, what we need to do, what we need to put into the uh, into the code to calibrate this correctly. So let's try that one more time. What's happening there? There's a really loose connection on the uh, the data pin, and that's what's happening. I think, it, I think it's throwing it out a little bit. Let's try that again. It's just holding this very tightly. So what I might do is solder these wires onto one of these little pins. Okay, so we're just uh, orienting this thing around. It's hard to tell if that's still uh, updating anything. We should, once we've finished it, come up with the uh, measurement we need to make. Oh, God, the sake. There we go, right. So what it's given us there is the calibration settings and these are X, Y, and Z um, adjustments that we need to make to our code. And what we have to do is basically just cut and paste that into any code that we use that uses this library. So we would take note of that. And then when we write a program of our own to uh, access this, we would put that into the calibration settings. So that's how we calibrate um, um, the magnetometer. Now let's see if we've got some code that can actually get some data into the window. Um, so I think it's this one here. Can I right click and open that in open with I want it to open with the Arduino IDE. Okay there we go. Okay, let's give this a compile. Let's go full screen on the Raspberry Pi so we can see what we're doing. Right, so we're going to click on the compile. So what this program does is quite simple. It defines some um, uh, a compass. It uses this um, library uh, that we've just downloaded. 
the serial dot begin sets up our serial port compass dot init initializes the compass and you can see there this is where we have to paste in that um, that value yes that value there that we've just taken I don't know whether that's actually accurate because I didn't really rotate it vigorously enough I don't think but we'll put it in anyway um, and then the main loop um, there's a couple of different um, variables there so xyz are quite self-explanatory a is the azimuth which again is the, if, if we have true north magnetic north our angle orientation from that is the azimuth so it's kind of our orientation um, in space so if this is uh, the north pole you know whatever our angle is from that that's the azimuth and the bearing is the the letters the north northwest and and so on so I'll just go full screen again so we can see that. So there we go. All it will do then is get the compass, um, get the direction, sorry, get the bearing, get the X, Y, Z, and then print them out. So let's see if this works for us. Let's compile the sketch. So what's it not happy with there? All right, so it's the... Uh, have we got that plugged in? Yes, we have. Have we got it? So the selected no we've not and let's just try uploading that oops still can't find that because it thinks it's busy is that because we've got it open on another window let's just close out some of these other um, other windows I know sometimes it can uh, not be happy if you've got a port a serial port open let's get rid of the calibration one I need a mouse mat on here as well I'm using the official Raspberry Pi uh, keyboard and mouse, but I've got this sat on a very narrow desk, and uh, whenever I try and move anything around, I sort of hit up against the other keyboard and mouse that I've got sat there. Um, okay, so that's that one. Let's try again. Upload. Oh, that's better this time. Okay, done. So if we open up the serial monitor port. Okay, so we're getting some information now so if we move this around you can see there that it's uh, it's getting different orientations um, I'm not convinced that these are correct at the moment so it just happens that my house is oriented almost exactly north so as I look out my window as I'm facing this desk this camera now uh, north is in that direction so really if this if this smart robot is also looking north then um, we should get north on there so I'm not convinced at the moment I've got that um, calibration correct but these are the values we get so we're getting an x we're getting a y we're getting a z we're getting an azimuth we're getting a bearing and we're getting a direction now one of the things i find quite interesting on this uh, arduino ide if you've not used it before in, in anger that is is as well as the serial port monitor there's a there's a plotter as well and what that will do is if you're outputting lots of values it will graph those values and you don't really have to tell it very much for it to to enable that to work so we can see there we're getting some um, values appearing on the screen and if I move this around you can see that they then change so the raw values that are coming which is the X Y and Z they can be anything between from minus 8,000 to plus 8,000 um, that's just the way that it measures it that's the the type of thing so we go back to our code and we just um, you know get rid of the x y and z for a second by doing command and forward slash that oops didn't quite do what i wanted to do there we go um so what that's done is commented out the uh, the code so we can see there if i highlight that again just do command and forward slash that's very odd behavior it works every way, everywhere else. So you should be able to just select them and do um, command and forward slash, and it should just slash them out there like that. But it's not doing whatever. Okay, so we've got rid of that. So all we've got now is azimuth bearing and direction. So if we now upload that code, we go back to our serial plotter. Um, we are then just looking at these um, angles. So if we move this around, we can see we should be getting values between 0 and 360, depending on what our direction is. 
So you can see that as I'm rotating this around, we are indeed getting different uh, orientations of that. Well, like I said, I, I don't think this is working quite right. I also understand that um, these um, devices have gimbal lock. Um, so if you've ever seen the film uh, Apollo 13, I think they talk about gimbal lock on there. And what that's to do is if you've got a, a, an old-fashioned gyroscope, uh, remember those devices where you can sort of attach somebody inside and they can sort of spin round in three different axes. If two of those axes um, are in the same orientation, then it can't move in the third orientation. That's called gimbal lock. It's probably something better explained if you Google it and you, you see what that means. But these suffer from gimbal lock as well. Um, but you can see there we're getting some readings coming out of the device as I'm moving this around. Um, you can see it jump between 360 and 0. And um, we can use things like the modulus function. If you've ever used that uh, in any of your maths, what that will do, if you've got, um, if you want to say we're at 300 degrees and we want to move 90 degrees, um, obviously you can't have 90 plus 360 degrees. That'll be more than 360 degrees. So if you use the mod function, that will slice off um, part of the, the number, giving you just what you're after. So if we did, um, you know, a number equals modulus 360, um, it'll give us the orientation we're after. So we can do things like 359 plus 90 degrees, and it'll slice it off and say 89 degrees. So there we go. So we, we, we're looking at the... Um, the data that's coming through we can see that it's um it's taking quite a few readings and it's kind of wobbling about a little bit so we can use that smoothing function you can do set smoothing as a part of the library so if we we have a look at that now let's just close that uh go back to the raspberry pi screen let's just close that out no oh, i didn't want to close that one, did i let's just try that open that again sorry in the arduino id And let's just set the smooth in on there. Okay, so where we've got our, our loop there and our setup, we can also do things like compass.set smoothing, I think it is. Yep, there we go. And then you set how many different readings that you want to take. Um, so we could say set um, 10. And what that will do is it'll take 10 readings and average them out. So if we do that and upload it. Uh, what's it not happy with there? Expects two arguments. So I can't remember off the top of my head what the right thing to do is there, so let's just go to have a look at his, his uh, documentation. So it's not that one, it's the other one. Let's go back to our code. I think there's a, le there's a link in the, uh, the code to the URL we're after. No, of course there's not. Okay, well, there's the, the command in there. I can't remember what that is, but essentially you just do a set smoothing, and um, that will enable us to smooth out the the, you know, the the readings that we're taking, average them for us. So it's really just doing a loop so many times, and then totaling it, averaging out by that. And you get a much more smoother reading, but it takes a little bit longer because it's going to take all those different readings. So that's how we, we use the compass. And... Um, the MPU 6050 is basically very similar to that. So the complexity there is because we have to add to these X, Y, and Zs the acceleration. So what I was thinking we could do for the SMARS robot and why I thought it was a value to us to have that module would be we can detect collisions. So we can be monitoring the... Um, so if this is our X plane and our Y's across that. If we hit something... Um, we will see a spike of acceleration in the opposite direction that we're traveling. And we could actually have a bit of code that looks for that to say, you know, have you collided? Have we seen one of these spikes? Is the value from that acceleration, say, over 5,000, you know, raw units? And if we do see that, we know that we've hit something. And um, we can then stop the robot as if it's just done a, a rangefinder um you know, object detected. We can use that as another type of object detection. So collisions is quite a useful thing. 
Uh, we can also see if we flipped over. So I was thinking, you know, for Camellio's um, code for the Otto DIY, he's got, um, you know, a biped robot that walks around. And, uh, you know, if that flips completely over, you might want to detect that as a state. Um, and you might also want to use it to help balance and uh, counteract if, uh, if something's tipping too far, you can make it correct it before it's a problem. So we want to be able to use it to do the R as well so that we can detect what orientation we are. We can pair that with the, the compass um, to get an even more accurate reading. And ultimately we could look at things like the Bluetooth for beacons. Um, they should be reasonably cheap to make. Um, the GPS one, I'm not sure for indoor use with, with um, you know, a smart robot, whether GPS would really help us out because GPS is accurate for domestic purposes to about a meter. So yeah, that's quite a long way for this little device to travel. Um, if you're a drone and you're flying in the air, it's not too bad to be you know, within a meter's space because these things are traveling you know, 500 meters or so. Whereas this little thing, um, 500 meters is quite a long way for it to travel. So really, I'm not sure GPS would be the perfect answer for our use, um, but pairing up the, the gyroscope, the accelerometer, the magnetometer, and maybe some Bluetooth beacons would enable us to quite accurately move our robot around and do some interesting things with it. So that's all the things I wanted to, to show you today. Um, what I do want to say though is um, please do subscribe to the channel. It really does help me out um, to understand you know, which videos have uh, been successful, which ones people like topics wise, which ones people don't like topic wise. Um, if you comment in the sections there, it always, again helps me get feedback to know what topics to cover, um, what kind of depth to go into for these things. And um, yeah, please, please, please uh, like and subscribe and comment. It really does help me out. So uh, also have a look at the website. Um, there's lots of tutorials and uh, good stuff on uh, smilesfan.com. Um, I'm always updating that now on a sort of daily basis with, uh, with new stuff. So yeah, please check that out. And um, yeah, on Sunday we'll be looking at Bluetooth. So uh, I shall see you then. Thanks everybody. Um, see you soon.